my lane fast, call it high speed I've been working hard, yeah, I've been working nightly If you think you'll win, ha, not fucking likely I be taking shots, yeah, cold-blooded, icy Watching numbers grow is what I call sightseeing In the front row, run it up when they hype me The following grows, they know how to ignite me Call me CEO, I've been running shit right, see And I ain't playing games, I create my own lane Making pleasure out of Welcome back to Ginger Ninja's Movie Reviews. I'm the Ginger Ninja and these are my Franchise Friday Movie Reviews. Now, if you're new to my channel, you're probably wondering, what am I doing? Well, it's Friday here in Australia, so every Friday we look at a film in a franchise and we are going through the Hellraiser franchise. Now, we are up to the third film in the series, Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth from 1992. Now, before I get into that, do want to say there will be spoils ahead so if you have not seen this film yeah go see it definitely <laughs> go check it out come back and then watch this let me know what you thought of it as well anyway before i dribble on too much i do want to say a big thank you to all my new and existing subscribers you know it's truly appreciated i say it every week but i do mean it thank you so much anyway let's get into this film because that's what we're here for now, the film was directed by Anthony Hickox, who is a phenomenal director. Unfortunately, he did pass away a few years back, so rest in peace. Um, he has done some great films like Waxwork, Sundown, just to name a couple. Yeah, and this one here is no exception. I'm a huge fan of his work. And this film, it's, yeah, you're going to hear me talk about it quite a bit. So sit back, get comfortable, because I've got a lot to say about this one. Uh, now, the movie actually stars Terry Farrell, Kevin Bernhardt, Ken Carpenter, Paula Marshall, and of course, Doug Bradley. Now, the plot, and this is direct from IMDb, an investigative reporter must send the newly unbound Pinhead and his legions back to hell. It's pretty accurate. Um, and look, the term unbound, yeah. So this could have been Hellraiser 3, Unbound or Unleashed or something like that. And yeah, I'll get to that in a moment. But this third installment is a bit of a change of pace from the first two films with the story shifting from an intimate, more claustrophobic environment, you know, with um, those dark, cramped hallways of hell, you know, the, um, the house in the first one, yeah, that was very much situated in one place. This takes the film to a more broader urban landscape. And it's this transition that gives it a more mainstream horror feel uh, by removing that gothic ambience. And that really defined the first two films. Now, this isn't a bad thing. It feels like it brings the film forward in time and gives it a new, fresh atmosphere and this in turn sets a precedent for future installments, for better or worse. We'll find out soon. Let's not jump too far ahead because for me, like I said, this was a very enjoyable entry into the franchise. And like I said, while the first two were a little bit more subdued and a little bit more atmospheric, relying on a more slow buildup of tension, Hellraiser 3 goes for a more bombastic approach. Um, it's got an increased body count and a faster pace and it shifts this it's this shifting of the film's style that makes it more accessible to a broader audience and i think this is actually what set pinhead up as a horror icon more than the first two because he's given more to do and look the film may disappoint you know purists of you know hellraiser hellraiser 2 even the hellbound heart which i haven't read i know i should but i haven't but yeah if you prefer the slow burn approach of the first two you may be disappointed in this but if you're after something that is flat out balls of all crazy don't skip this one All right, so let's have a look at the cast. And look, the characters themselves are a mixed bag. You've got Joey Summerskill, 
and she's an engaging lead. She's courageous. She's resourceful, and she's easy to easy to root for. Terry Farrell plays her and brings a certain charm and determination to her role, making her a very solid anchor for this entry. J.P. Munro, on the other hand, played by Kevin Barnhart, is a quintessential 90s sleazebag. He just looks sleazy, and he suits a very similar feel of Frank from the first two films, more so the first one, but... And he does feel like more of a caricature than a character, and he embodies all the traits of a greedy, morally bankrupt villain. And in some parts, it is hard to take him seriously, but I also think that's part of the point of this, because he is not the villain focus. That is Pinhead, played by Doug Bradley. And as always, he steals the show as Pinhead, more so in this than the previous two. He's terrifying, he's cinematic, and his dialogue is dripping with dark poetry, humour, and also philosophical musings on pain and pleasure. And this reinforces his role as an iconic figure in horror cinema. Like I mentioned before, it's these scenes with Pinhead where the movie truly shines. It's Bradley's performance that elevates the material, and this is the first time that the character is given room to grow and expand on. Yes, he has dual roles, Elliot Spencer and Pinhead, but it is Pinhead's moment to shine in this film. As for the supporting cast, particularly Paula Marshall, they do add depth to the narrative, um, but it's their interactions with Joey and Pinhead and their eventual fates that highlight the film's exploitation of human vice and consequences of seeking power and pleasure at any cost. And now onto the directing and the writing. And as I mentioned, Anthony Hickox is a solid director. I love Waxworks, like that is an awesome, fun film. Sundown, criminally underrated vampire film. If you haven't seen Sundown, I highly recommend you check it out. But it's his direction that keeps the film's pacing brisk and it balances moments of intense horror with quieter, more suspenseful scenes that build tension. There's a transition from investigative journalism to full-blown supernatural horror that is handled quite adeptly with uh, Hickox ensuring that the film maintains a sense of dread and unpredictability throughout. The film is a departure from the sadistic and hedonistic side of pleasure and pain that was a focal point of the first two films. And while this opens up the world of Hellraiser, it does lose a lot of its philosophical depth um, that distinguish the series. Moments of genuine horror are interspersed with unintentionally humorous scenes and over-the-top dialogue, particularly from JP. Yeah, if you know the scenes that I'm referring to, yeah, it's the bedroom scenes, of course. Um, and this does disrupt the film's atmosphere. And it's a tonal imbalance that makes it difficult for audiences to remain immersed and engaged within the horror experience. Now, this is actually highlighted with the introduction of new Cenobites. You've got camera head, CD head, Barbie, piston head. Now, these are somewhat weaker Cenobites when you compare them to the ones from one and two. And whilst that is explained, it's the, the dialogue that these new Cenobites have that is quite poor with one-liners and puns that just really aren't suited. You know, uh, camera head with your it's time for your close-up. You know, it's just it just feels wrong. It doesn't feel like Hellraiser. You know, if you look at Butterball, Chatterer, you had the female lead Cenobite in the first two who gave off this very creepy killing. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe this. This terrifying vibe. These ones don't have it. They're, they're you know. They look good, but they don't sound good. Um, I think Paula Marshall's character, Terry, her sound about Dreamer is probably the exception, but even still the way they move, they move 
a lot faster they're, when they're surrounding um, when they're surrounding Terry Farrell's character. That's going to get confusing. Terry Farrell and <laughs> Terry, the character. So Joey is being surrounded by Piston Head and Dreamer, and the way they're moving, it just doesn't feel right. Like the Cenobites usually have this way of moving that is methodical and yeah. Another thing I do want to point out is the soundtrack of Hellraiser 3, and this really complements the dark and menacing atmosphere and the use of heavy metal music, particularly in the scenes set in J.P. Munro's nightclub, The Boiler Room. It contrasts with the eerie orchestral score that underscores the more suspenseful and terrifying moments, particularly when Pinhead is on screen and you've got that reveal is probably the best way I can describe it. But it's this juxtaposition that enhances a film's chaotic and otherworldly feel. And it does bring you back in and immerse you in to the nightmarish world. And now onto the effects. And look, it's a Hellraiser film, so it's you've got to have special effects in there, right? And look, from a, for a film from the early 90s, this film does not shy away from gore and practical effects. And look, there's not as many skinless people in this one. I think there was only one. Yeah, wow. The practical effects still hold up. The Cenobites, they are awesome. And they are creatively designed, and each one has a unique look. And it's a blend of human and machine in these ones, mostly. And that could be due to the, you know, maybe there's a change in technology from the 80s to the 90s, you know, Technology's changed, but whilst the design and special effects team do a commendable job, the introduction of these new Cenobites, like the CD throwing DJ, <sighs> yeah, it veers into the territory of camp and it does undermine the film's intended horror. So whilst they do look good, they also, yeah, they're not good. <laughs> It's a very, it's a catch one two situation. I love the designs of the um, original Cenobites. These ones I don't mind, but they just seem very, I don't know, there's just something about them that just, they're not suited to Hellraiser. I don't know, I just, yeah, I think there are better designs out there. I think they've done well, but yeah, they're, they're just not Cenobites. And look, there is some CGI in this. Um, you know, it's the early 90s, so they are bringing in CGI. The, this is not age well. Like, I'll be honest with you, the CGI does not look good. However, they do only use it minimally. There are only two scenes from memory where there's CGI. Skinless girl being dragged into the hell monolith, or statue, whatever you want to call it. And a scene with um, Elliot Spencer and Pinhead um, merging into one, which then leads on to some really good practical effects with their faces melding into each other. Now, look, there is one particular scene in the nightclub when the carnage is unleashed in that, that's really memorable. It's blood so chaotic. It's crazy. There's a scene with cue balls stuffed in someone's mouth. There's body parts flying. There's blood everywhere. It it's a, feels like a macabre dance of death with Pinhead at the centre orchestrating all the madness. Now, rewatchability, and look, I saw this in the 90s, and this was a go-to. Like, yeah, I really enjoyed watching Pinhead being unbound and unleashed and seeing his evolution, although I didn't think of it back then, Looking back on it now, I see his evolution from his original intended character in one. He expanded more in his role in two, but this one, this was a huge change of pace from the dark and gruesome Hellraiser one and two. And whilst this had the same or very similar levels of violence and gore, it was just more accessible to a, you know, for me as a teenager growing up and watching this, like this was more my style. And so that's probably why I enjoy this one, even on repeat viewings. And yeah, so will I watch it again? You bet I will. Okay, so final verdict and Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. 
Man, this is a worthy continuation of the Hellraiser series, and it expands on the characters while delivering the visceral horror that we've come to expect. It successfully combines elements of supernatural horror and a psychological exploration of human nature, uh, particularly with um, Joey and her search for her father and JP and his you know, search for that next level, which, like I said, very in line with Frank from the original film. It, it does like that philosophical depth of the original, but it compensates this with increased action, memorable characters, and striking visuals. You know, the, that statue, the pillar or, or monolith or whatever you want to call it, that's a work of art. It looks amazing. And look, for fans of the series and horror aficionados, Hellraiser 3 is a must-watch. You know, it just reaffirms Pinhead's status as a legendary figure in the genre. Overall, for a score, I would give this film a 7.5 out of 10. And there you have it. That is my review of Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. Like I said, it, it doesn't quite hit the same notes as the first two, but for me, it's just something I can just... I wouldn't even say it's a guilty pleasure. It's just a pleasure to watch. So anyway, what did you think of this film? Let me know down in the comments below. I love hearing your thoughts on this film, on these films, and this franchise as a whole. I know I've got some rough parts coming up, but I'm pretty sure there's a couple of little gems hidden in these films. So... Um, and I know people have mentioned the, you know, the later films, they're not Hellraiser films as such, but yeah, I'm still going to, I'm sure I'm going to find something to enjoy out of them. Maybe, I hope. Guess we'll find out. Anyway, before I blather on too much, thank you very much for watching. If you haven't already, please do hit that thumbs up button, be much appreciated. And of course, if you've made it this far through my ramblings, please do subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell. So that way you are notified every time I do release a new review. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Have a great day. Bye.